Kaylee Gonzalez shared this photo on Instagram. It's a photo of herself surrounded by her pals, which include Issa Chapin, Madison Mogan, and Zaina Canodo. Underneath the photo, she writes, One lucky girl to be surrounded by these people. Shortly after posting the photo, Kaylee, Ethan, Madison, and Zaina were all found murdered in their off campus home. Welcome back to the alternate corner with me, Della. Um, so, before I get going, please remember to like this video, subscribe to it, and hit that notification bell so you know when I, I go live or when I post uh, videos. So, for those of you that might be watching from the US, probably know everything about this case up, up, up till now. But this is more aimed towards the UK audience and also several other countries that may never have heard about this case. What I can tell you about it is you need to know about this case. This is an intriguing case. This is going to be a big case, in my opinion. And therefore, I'm going to give, in this video, a broad overview um, of what happened and also introduce you to some of the victims um, and the accused. And then further videos will include my co-host, myself, delving more deeply into uh, the affidavit and also some of the other key players, uh, the Moscow Police Department, the FBI and things like that. And then as we progress and have guests, we'll delve deeper and deeper into uh, various cases. So this is just a broad overview. I know most of you have seen it before and understand it. This is a bit of a refresher. And I do give some education lessons in this as well about the university and uh, the history of, of Idaho, um, just to try and do a little bit different. But So please watch it. You might refresh you, you might learn something. And just remember, this is just for educational reasons. Please do your own research. I have no legal background. I'm not giving legal advice or anything like that. Um, so yeah, with that, let's go. In this episode, we're heading over to Moscow in Idaho. Now, this isn't to be confused by Moscow and Russia. Historians have disputed the precise origin of the name Moscow. There's no conclusive proof that's con that is connected to the Russian capital, though various accounts suggest it purposely evoked the Russian city or was named by Russian immigrants. Moscow is a city in north-central Idaho. It's located along the state border with Washington. It has a population of just over 25,000, according to the 2020 census. The county seat and largest city of Leiter County. Moscow is the home of the University of Idaho, the state's land-grant institution and primary research university. While the university is Moscow's dominant employer, the city also serves as an agricultural and commercial hub for the region. The 70 neighbourhood parks located throughout the town offered a wide variety of venues for outdoor activities and offers plenty for the residents to do throughout the year. The University of Idaho itself is Idaho's oldest public university. It's located in the city of Moscow. It is, it is the state's flagship land grant and primary research university. The University of Idaho was the state's sole university for 71 years until in 1963 and its College of Law, established in 1909, and was first accredited by the American Bar Association in 1925. The University of Idaho was formed on January 30th, 1889. The university opened its doors in 1892 on October, th October 3rd with an initial class of 40 students. The first graduating class in 1896 contained two men and two women. It presently has an enrollment exceeding 12,000 students, with over 11,000 on the Moscow campus. The university offers 142 degree programs 
including bachelor's, master's, doctoral and specialist degrees. Students themselves play an integral role in the Moscow community and make up nearly half the population. So the story now takes us to 1122 King Road. This is the residence that, um, as you can see a picture here of, this is where Dylan Mortensen, Katie Gonzalez, Bethany Funk, Madison Morgan, Zaina Cronodal, and there's also a sixth housemate, but they weren't, uh, they weren't there in the picture and also they weren't in the area during the murders. So these were the six that lived in the house. You can see the back of the house as well. It's quite a large house and it's known as a bit of a party house. To what extent? Well, students, parties, just it happens. But recently some videos have been coming out as well of uh, some police that popped over for disruptions. So, yeah, you can see there are some parties here, but what students don't have parties, but we'll look at some of the clips anyway, just to see um, the interactions that some of the girls had with the police. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, is this your place? Yeah. Perfect, you know why we're here? Uh, and I assume noise. Noise, yeah. Yeah. Big speaker right there. Yeah. Nothing against having a party. Once neighbors start calling in, then we have an issue. Fair. Uh, you go to school? Uh, yeah. Okay. What year? Senior. Senior. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you the same thing I told them. You probably know the drill, right? Actually, no. Oh, okay. So usually, at least for me, I'll give you a verbal warning. Okay. Uh, once I have neighbors calling in, your music's too loud. You're disturbing the peace. Yeah. Nothing against having parties. Nothing against having people over who are overage to drink. Mm -hmm. But again, once we start disturbing the neighbors, then we've got an issue. Yeah. Noise ticket is up to 300. Yeah, and... somewhere around 300. Okay. It's a pretty expensive ticket. I don't want to give that to you. Yeah. That being said, this is your place, so I'm going to hold you responsible. Uh -huh. Because it is your place, you're also responsible for everybody here. Yeah. So I'm going to grab your info. Yeah. Um, and if I do have to come back here, uh, a 300 some dollar tickets coming your way. Okay. And it only gets more expensive from there. Is that fair? Yeah, that's okay. fair. Absolutely. Sounds good. I'd much rather you spend that 300 bucks on beer or something fun than yeah, a noise yeah. ticket, right? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. That being said, warnings, don't do it again. Yep. I'd hate to come back in a few hours and then have to issue that. So, yeah. any questions for me? No. All right. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Yeah. Turn the music down. Hey guys, second time. I need one. I need somebody to come to the door. All right, we'll get someone to come to the door. Music stays off. Party's over. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Hello, Miss. Hello. What's your name? Zana. Zana, do you live here? Yes. Hey, did Megan talk to you earlier? I no. Okay, does Megan live here? Megan, I do not have a Megan that lives Megan here. Mogan? Maddie Mad uh, Mogan, yes. Madison Mogan, yeah. Madison Mogan, okay, she does Sorry, live here. Sorry, we, she is at the club. She's 21, I'm just going to bed. I have a couple of friends over, but okay. this is my idea. Did, have you talked to Maddie tonight? Yes, I have. Oh. She's at the cl corner club. Okay, did she, did she tell you anything about anything that happened earlier or anything like that? Honestly, not really. I'm. I've just been here the past hour. Okay. Okay. Just trying to go to bed. Can and, I grab your ID for me? If yeah, you I'm her. not 21. I'm. Okay. My roommates are 21. I just came well, to go to bed. We're, we're not here for. We're not here to talk about the alcohol stuff. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but th this is the second noise complaint we've had here tonight within two hours. I'm sorry. Okay. About that. So this time it was the blonde gal and the guy on the back also, porch. Playing music, okay. So I sincerely apologize about that. Okay. I, I'm just going to bed. Okay. So, so just so you understand, you could be getting a misdemeanor citation for this, which means you have to go in front of a judge and explain why you couldn't keep the people in your house quiet. Okay. okay. We've already talked to Maddie once and told her the same thing. 
Okay. The only reason she's not getting a ticket is because she's not standing here in front of me. But I'm telling you right now, if we have to come back, you're getting a ticket. Well, I got to say, I thought, I thought Kaylee and Zena both acted appropriate. Uh, they owned up to it. They were like, yep, yeah, that's fine. Didn't answer back. Obviously, maybe a little bit intoxicated, but you know, every student's been there. Anyone that criticizes that, bore off. You know, everyone drinks, geez. Um, but it's all more moderation. And I thought the officers did fantastically well as well. Uh, they could have just given tickets out left, right, and centre, especially in the Zayn situation. It was obviously late and obviously loud. Um, maybe it was being played. But again, they use common sense. Um, so, yeah, I think we're probably going to delve a little bit deeper into some of these calls later on, but I don't think we need to right now. But very polite interaction and, yeah, fair play on both sides, I think. Brilliant. So we're moving on now to the 12th of November, 2022. I was started out as a normal night. Didn't end as a normal night. This horrific attack on four college students happened less than a mile from the University of Idaho campus. Sororities and fraternities and their out of houses are mostly centralized in this area. New information from Idaho State Police reveals two of the victims, Ethan Chapin and Zana Kronodal, were together Saturday night, November 12th. They went to a Sigma Chi fraternity party across from their home on King Road from 8 to 9 p.m. The other two victims, Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Mogan, were at the Corner Club on Main Street. It's about a mile and a half away from the home on King Road. Police say they were there from around 10 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. After leaving the bar, the girls went to the grub truck just down Main Street from the Corner Club. It's about a six-minute walk. They're seen in a video from the food truck, ordering food around 1.40 Sunday morning. U of I students tell us it's a common weekend routine to go from the corner club to the food truck. Idaho State Police says all four victims were back at the King Road house, a little more than a mile from the food truck, by 1.45 a.m. Sunday, November 13th. What unfolded after that is unclear. It wasn't until noon on Sunday police received a call of an unconscious person. When they got to the home on King Road, they found the four victims, Ethan, Zanna, Kaylee, and Maddie, dead. They confirm all four were stabbed early Sunday morning. The Latah County coroner tells us all the victims could have been killed with the same knife or a very similar knife. So at the time, that's all we knew, obviously. But as the months have gone on and on, more and more has come out. And there is a a lot more to cover in terms of the house and people involved. But we didn't know that until the affidavit came out. And I don't want to cover that without my co-host, who knows that piece of paper much better than I do. Piece of paper, document, you idiot. Okay, she knows that document a lot better than I do. Um, so we will be delving into it, probably in the next video, a lot more detail about the inside of the house, and also the affidavit itself. Uh, so don't worry about that. But as I said, this is a brief overview for those to catch up on the case. I want to show you here as well a picture just to show you of the blood coming up from the outside. Um, that was released quite early on. I can see you there. That's from Sena's bedroom. Um, or was presumed to be from Sena's bedroom. I think it is, it is now confirmed, which we will get that confirmed. Um, that's horrible to look at. Um, so this was horrendous. And I have no words. Um, so with that, as I say, we're going to go into more detail as we go along. There's, there's a lot more things involved here, guys. But I want to keep this video fairly short and delve into it in the next video. So as I've said, we're going and do a deeper dive um, in other videos. But I think it's more poignant for us now to look at the actual victims in all of this and concentrate on them for a little bit. So with that, with the four of them here, um, I'll go through each one individually and explain you know, a little bit more about them. Um, but as majority of people do know, or if you don't know, Kaylee and Madison, they, they were, they well, they met in middle school. and. They've been best friends and actually they see themselves as, as 
sisters. That's how close they are. And Zayna and Ethan, they're both dating. So they're in a relationship. Um, and the reason Ethan was there that evening was because he was staying over with Zayna. Uh, just to explain that, because he doesn't live there himself. So yeah, so I just want to explain that. And with that, I'll go through each one individually now and give you a bit of background. Hayley J. Gonzalez. She was born in Concord, California on June 8th, 2001. According to her obituary, even before her birth, Kaylee was fire and life. Her parents, Stephen Kirsty's third child. She was wild and different. She was born with black, thick curls, with the cutest button nose and a perfectly round porcelain face marked with a tiny scar on her forehead that even the doctors wouldn't quite understand or be able to explain. Much to her dismay though, later in life, her siblings would tease her that that's where her horns try to grow in. Kirsty and Steve continued on to have two more girls, making Kaylee the middle child of five. Around the age of one, Kaylee and the family moved to North Idaho, where she continued to blossom into the most beautiful, authentic, social and funny person. She loved clothes and fashion and accessories and doing whatever she could to get a laugh out of those around her. Kaylee went to Bora Elementary with her, with her older brother and sister, before moving on to Charter Academy for middle school, where she and Maddie Morgan found one another. After that day, they were no longer a family of five siblings, they were six. After much convincing of her parents, Kaylee went to Lake City High School before attending the University of Idaho with Maddie. She joined the Alpha Phi sorority and was studying to become an elementary school teacher. Throughout all her years of education, Kaylee maintained incredible grades and made friends wherever she went. She was a social, quirky, contagious and a little bit of a goofball. She loved to play pranks on her friends and family constantly. She loved adventure. She was a hard worker, always having a full-time job on top of her studies, even in high school. Kaylee loved the nicer things in life and took a lot of pride in buying those things for herself. She was strong. She was fair. She was tough. She was dedicated. She was beautiful. She was, and she is, love. Madison May Mogan was born on May 23rd, 2001 in Eugene, Oregon. According to her obituary, her life from day one has been a blessing to her family and all that surrounded her. Maddie spent her first two years of life in Oregon, and then she moved with her family back to the North Idaho area, exactly where her parents grew up in. Back in Idaho, she went on to have a wonderful childhood. She attended Winton Elementary, then went on to join the Charter Academy, until she made the decision after writing a very decisive letter with Kaylee to both sets of parents with lots of reasons of why they should instead enrol to LCHS, where she would graduate. To say Maddie is loved by all is an understatement. Maddie was known for her ability to make others smile and laugh with her offbeat and hilarious sense of humour and is well known by all who knew her, to never let her get hungry. Madi was also admired for her focus and dedication 
to her future. She excelled in school and all jobs she worked at throughout high school and college, amassing a network of friends, colleagues, supervisors and teachers who would not hesitate to give her an amazing reference and remark on how wonderful she was, how hard she worked and how much she cared. Maddie was so excited to attend the University of Idaho. A little far from home, but not too far. Once there, Maddie made the Dean's List every single semester. She joined P. Better Fee sorority and met some of her closest friends, all the while having her sister Kaylee close by and the love of her life, Jake. We will think of her forever, surrounded by pink sparkly things that are tiny and cute, because that's exactly how we all picture Maddie. Zaina Kenodal of Post Falls, Idaho. Zaina was born in Idaho at Kutenai Health Hospital on July 5th, 2002. According to obituary, Sana grew up in Post Falls and was a talented gymnast as a child. She attended Post Falls Middle and High School, where she played volleyball, track and soccer, until she graduated in 2020. During high school, she worked at Texas Roadhouse and went on to attend the University of Idaho, where she majored in marketing and was an active member of P. Better Fee Sorority. And also, she was a big part of the Vandal Solutions sales team. When she was participating in these activities, she was working at a part-time job at Mad Greek Restaurant in Moscow, Idaho. Zana loved her dogs, Shoeshine. She enjoyed EDM music, going to concerts, spending time with her friends, and going on family trips with her sister and father. When she was little, she loved spending time on her grandma and grandpa's farm and summers at the river. Zaina was someone who was loved dearly by her family, friends and classmates. She was a very positive and outgoing person who went out of her way to make everyone feel welcome. Her desire to live life to the fullest and contagious sense of humour has made a lasting impression on all those who knew her. Zaina was just starting to become the woman she was destined to be. And the world will be a lesser place without her. Ethan Chapin was born triplet. He was the first born at 4.43pm on a beautiful Tuesday evening in October. According to his obituary, he was born at Swedish Hospital in Seattle. Maisie arrived shortly after at 4.44pm and Hunter came in third place at 4.45pm. The family spent the first year and a half living in Olympia at Summit Lake and then moved to Conway. The kids attended Conway School where they got a great education and also played soccer, basketball and ran cross country. One of Ethan's greatest memories was on the basketball court with his brother at Conway wearing jersey number 30. Ethan attended Mount Vernon High School. His school was cut short by COVID, so Ethan and his siblings packed up and headed to Idaho where they went to work at Hills Resort. They went back to Mount Vernon to start their senior year, but school was still not in person in session. They worked at Tulip Town through the Tulip season and then headed back to Idaho to continue working at Hills Resort during the summer, just prior to attending the University of Idaho. In August of 2021, the family made the journey to University of Idaho to drop off all three of their children at college. The boys, both Ethan and Hunter, 
fraternity of Sigma Chi, and Maisie joined Kappa Alpha Theta Sorority. Since attending the University of Idaho, Ethan lived his best life. He loved the social life, intramurals, and tolerated the academics. He also continued to play a lot of sports as well. If you didn't find Ethan on the golf course or working, you could usually find him surfing, playing sand, volleyball, or pickleball. Ethan loved life. He laughed continuously. He smiled when he woke up and was still smiling when he went to bed. He was kind to all and a friend to all. May we all try to make the earth a better place. And may we all live like Ethan. So as you can imagine, with four vicious murders, there's a huge investigation which was uh, led by the Moscow Police Department, but also supported by the Idaho State Police and the Leita County Sheriff's Office. This had a huge focus, especially in America, because four students dying, and it seemed to be no news after that. The police department covered everything close to the vest. I know they had a lot of tips and stuff like that. I think they had over two and a half thousand email tips. Um, it was close to three thousand phone calls, and um, I think there was about a thousand digital media submissions just to help. Um, it's it's hard because you have got all that, but also you got other tips that come in. So I think. I believe it's close to 15,000 tips that they had. So I can imagine they have to go through every single one of those. That's going to be time consuming as well. But anyway, they weren't sharing any information. So nobody knew what the hell was going on. Um, so that's where we were. Didn't know anything. And then boom, all of a sudden, they're going to arrest someone on December 30th. They arrested somebody. And we were like, what? Now, obviously, as I've previously said so many times, we're going to cover uh, in depth a lot of this stuff. But essentially, how they could arrest this or this guy, um, the accuser, was they found some DNA trace on the um, sheath of the knife, the cover of the knife on the button, just very slight um, trace on it. So they got that. He had a car similar to what was seen in the area at the time of the murders. Um, And also, his phone pinged on different locations within the area. Now, again, we're going to go more in depth with some of these things because how reliable are all these things? We will see. We will go into it. I'm not an expert, but I've heard other people say they're not reliable, especially the, the phone data stuff. But we'll see. Again, it's all covered in the affidavit. There's more stuff. Some more things found since then, but I'm giving a brief overview of this. And essentially, at the time, that's what it was. That's what we knew. The car, the phone pings, and also the DNA. So you might be thinking, looking and thinking, who was this person? Now, obviously, the majority of people know. And I always get his name wrong. And I don't mean in a funny way, but the only way I can remember it is by thinking of, of the cider. Copperberger. So his name is Brian Kohlberger. And that's why I came up with Copperberger. Because I, there's no way in hell was I going to remember Kohlberger. Now I do. But at the time, for many months, no chance. So anyway, they arrested this guy. He's 28 years old. His name is Brian Christopher Kohlberger. And he was taken into custody by an FBI SWAT team uh, and the Pennsylvania State Police. And you might be thinking, what the hell? Pennsylvania State Police? You might not be thinking that, but if you were thinking that, yes. So he drove all the way from Pullman, where he lives, in Idaho, in Moscow, Idaho. His father flew out. And they both travelled all the way back from Idaho, 
all the way to Pennsylvania. Anyway, that's just of that. So what we're going to do now is cover a little bit more about who is Brian Kohlberger. And we'll see a little bit about how he, he got arrested and stuff like that. Thank you for coming today. Last night, in conjunction with the Pennsylvania State Police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, detectives arrested 28-year-old Brian Christopher Kohlberger in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, on a warrant for murder of Ethan, Zena, Madison, and Kaylee. I wanna personally thank these agencies for their assistance in this case. Koberger resides in Pullman, Washington, and is a graduate student at Washington State University. We will provide as much information as we can about the extradition to Idaho and the criminal process. However, due to Idaho state law, we are limited in what information we can release today until Kohlberger has been has his initial appearance in Idaho court. Brian Kohlberger was born on November 21st, 1984 in Oldsbrightsville, Pennsylvania. Oh, his parents are from Brooklyn, New York, and they moved to Pennsylvania after they got married. So, Brian attended Pleasant Valley High School um, and he attended Monroe Korean Technical Institute in Bartonsville, but he dropped out of that after a year and he later attended Northampton Community College in Bethlehem, where he earned a social degree in psychology. After graduation from Northampton, he worked as a security guard for the Pleasant Valley School District the same school district where his father previously worked as a maintenance worker for many years and his mother for a time as a substitute teacher. He received a BA in 2020 and an MA in 2022 in criminal justice. Um, he got that from the Sales University in Centre Valley, Pennsylvania. In the summer of 2022, Kohlberger moved to Washington state to pursue a PhD at Washington State University that is located in Pullman, which isn't far away from Moscow. Its campus is less than eight miles uh, west of Moscow. Uh, at the time of the killings, he was a doctoral student in criminology and had completed his first semester there nine days before his arrest. Kohlberger had been a teaching assistant at the um, Washington State University and less than two weeks before the murders, faculty members actually met with him to discuss growing concerns about his behaviour and conduct. Kohlberger was terminated from the teaching assistant role on December 19th with the decision being based on his unsatisfactory performance as a teaching assistant, including his failure to meet the norms of professional behaviour in his interaction with the uh, faculty. He also applied to become uh, a sort of intern with the Moscow, Moscow Police Department. Um, I don't know if he was successful or not in that, but his thesis or what he wanted to do was um, to look at technology and how to capture people using technology, essentially. Um, which is a bit ironic, but sure. Um, yes, so he was doing that. He's also accused of being a little bit sexist, that he would mark the female students a lot harder than the male students. We've heard from former students that, and friends of his that he had a drug problem when he was uh, younger. Um, he also was overweight when he was younger. Um, he got bullied a lot. Um, he always got turned down by by women. He didn't have a stable relationship or anything. If you go on TikTok and stuff like that, you'll see loads of stories. Just take it with a pinch of salt as well. We don't actually know what is true and what's not. Um, so, yeah, take it with a pinch of salt for now anyway, until I get my co-host in here who's an absolute expert in all this stuff. Um, so, yeah, th that's where we are. Now, as I said earlier on, he got caught got arrested, caught, arrested back in Pennsylvania. 
the drive from Pullman to Pennsylvania for people in the UK, that would have taken a couple of days with with some stops and stuff. It was a big drive. Like, we wouldn't do that sort of drive. We'd be flying. And um, I don't have the amount of miles there is and stuff in front of me. I should have. It's researched just better. But I don't. But it, essentially, it's madness. But his father flew out there and they travelled back together. Now, in Indianapolis, or just outside Indianapolis, they got stopped a couple of times. And um, stopped for speeding in a way or drive too closely to the cars but FBI deny it but essentially the FBI were accused of making these guys stop him and see where he was going and stuff like that it, the video is a bit shoddy um, uh, I'll show one of them now but you can see he's, he's a little bit nervous and stuff in there and his father's like what's going on it's all good and um, so yeah let's play that video now How y'all doing today? Good, good. Take a look at your driver's license real quick if I could. See, he's right up on that van, man. He was right up on the back end of that van. Hold you over for tailgating. Is this your car? Okay, cool. Where are you headed? Before we actually... Well, we come from WSU, and... What's WSU? Uh, yeah, I, I go to the university basically. That is Washington University. So we're okay. I, I'm having a hard time hearing you because of the traffic. So you're coming from Washington State University? Yeah. And you're going where? Oh. We're going to be going to Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. We're a little, we're slightly clutch because we drive for hours. Hours, days. Hours to drive. Well, yeah. Almost a day. Okay. And what did you say about some SWAT team thing? Or yeah, thing? there was, yeah, there was the this. mass shooting and everything. We don't where? This was all the Mm -hmm. So, so y'all work at the university there? I actually do work there. Oh. Do it. PhD and criminal. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't heard about that incident. Just yesterday or? No, it just happened one morning. About an hour and a half ago, we're still wrapping it up for investigating. I was not sure. So after he was arrested, um, he was then appointed a public defender and he was detained without any kind of bond at the Monroe County Correctional Facility in Pennsylvania. So that would have been the 30th of December. So he went back into court on January the 3rd, 2023, where he agreed to extradition. What that basically means is that he's going to go back from Pennsylvania all the way to Idaho to stand trial, essentially. He could have refused it. Normally they do send you, but it could have prolonged the whole the whole case, essentially. But he he said, yeah, waived it, his rights and just went straight. Um, so then they flew him um, to, to Pullman on the next day, January 4th. It took forever. I think it was a small, like... It's a, it's a small plane, but it was a very s slow plane. I remember people tracking it and it just took forever. They stopped quite a few times as well. Um, then from there, he was driven to Leiter County Jail uh, in Moscow, and he was held there without bail as well. So Koberger made his first appearance in the Leiter County Courthouse on January 5th, where he was charged with four counts of first-degree murder and one count of burglary. Uh, essentially because the burglary is therefore breaking into someone's home to, to commit a uh, felony. 
One week later, on January the 12th, Kohlberg had made his second appearance uh, for a state conference in the same room at the courthouse. A preliminary probable cause hearing was scheduled for June 26th at the same courthouse. I believe it starts at 9am on the 26th. So for a week, they're just going to go through the evidence, see if there's a case there and stuff like that. So he's got a new lawyer now, which we'll get into again um, uh, in the next video. But essentially, that's it in a nutshell. He's been accused. He's been arrested. He's obviously innocent until proven guilty. But obviously, social media is going wild. And the majority of people have got him guilty without any shadow of a doubt. Um, but yeah, we'll discuss it a bit more in depth um, next for the next video. I generally think this case is going to be huge. So I hope people stick around. As I say, this was just a brief overview. I've skipped a lot of stuff. Um, and a lot of detail. Next video, hopefully, we'll have a layout of the house, um, discuss more about where everyone was, who saw what, um, some of the other people that got accused, maybe some of the other players. I mean, there's a lot of info that we need to get through over the next couple of videos. Um, so, with that, that's basically where we are with it. Okay. So, Okay, guys, thank you. That's the end of the video. Um, as promised to you, we have a co-host, as promised to you. I said that I'd get somebody, select somebody that's totally opposite from me, didn't I? So, you said I'm ugly. Well, I got a beauty right here. You said I'm thick. Well, I got someone intelligent right here. I don't know much about this Brian Goldberger stuff, but she bloody well does. So you better give her a follow as well. Her Twitter's handles at the start of this video. Uh, you know the score. Give her support. She's brilliant. She's a wonderful. And with that, I'll throw her over to you. Hi, I'm Morgan. I'm Miss Morgan on Twitter. Um, I don't know everything about this case, but I'm looking forward to sharing what I do now. And I'm happy for the opportunity. Thank you. Awesome. You be so, you haven't you won't see much of Morgan in this video, but in future videos you be seeing a load more of her. So you know what to do, guys. Subscribe, like this video, share it, do all that crap. I'll see you on the other side. See you there uh, next week. Cheers.